So last Sunday, I started into a new sermon series, and today I'm picking up with that sermon series. And the title of my message today is The Fire of the Holy Spirit. Now, I like fire. I really do. I wouldn't consider myself a pyromaniac, but one of my favorite things to do in the spring, I love doing this in the spring, is to get a couple New York strips, one for me, one for Lanita, and none for the kids. Send them away. Just Lanita and I, and, and, and light up the grill, and New York strips on the grill, and I like to cut up some zucchini and squash and put it in there with some butter and some salt and pepper and put it on the grill and then add a few other things on there. And, and, and it just makes for an amazing dinner. I just love it out there on the fire. But then as fall comes, one of the things I love about the fall, and this is a beautiful part about the fall, is we, we have this little small fireplace outside, and I like to light it up and roast marshmallows out there. It just feels good. Now, how many, how many of you enjoy roasting marshmallows? You enjoy that? Okay. The rest of you do not know what you're missing. That or you're not honest with me. But now when I roast marshmallow, I like to catch the marshmallow on fire and allow the entire marshmallow to go from being that white to being that charcoal black before I eat it. Anybody else with me? Mmm. And now, now I'm hungry. But then there's, there's one other time I, I really like being around a fire, and that, that's turning on the fireplace. Sadly, that's how you do it in my house. You just flip the switch. I, I wish it was a real fireplace, but I didn't build the home. And so you turn on the fireplace, and a, a cup of hot chocolate, sitting there just watching the fire, having Christmas music play, and anybody else, you know what I'm talking about when it comes to fire. Wow, I lost a bunch of you there. It really is an amazing time. It really is. And so you might want to try that. So I'm preaching this morning on the fire of the Holy Spirit. And, and I love fire, and I love what fire can do for us. And here's, here's what you need to capture in this message today. This is my hope that you will capture this. That God has used the metaphor of fire. He has used fire as an analogy to teach him something, to teach us something about himself. There's something that God wants us to know about him. And he decided that fire was the best way to show that to us. And so here's my hope and my prayer for my own life. And, and, I, and I hope that you will actually choose to have the same hope in your life. Is that I would be a person that is really just enveloped with the fire of God. That the fire of God would be in me, that it would be in my bones, it would be in my gut, it would be in who I am. But not just in me but it would just be all around me. And the spiritual fire would just consume who I am. It would be in my words. It would be in my actions. It would be in my hands. That it would be everywhere about my life. And so when God decides to give us this picture, there's something that he's wanting to see. He didn't, he didn't just choose fire arbitrarily, but there's some message that he wants us to get. And so I want to talk to you this morning about this picture that we see of God being represented as fire. The first thing I want you to know is, is that he actually introduces himself through fire. He uses fire to introduce himself to us. We see this in the Old Testament where God is trying to get Moses' attention because he wants Moses, who is this guy who's living in exile away from the nation of Israel, he wants to get Moses to go back to the nation of Israel to lead them out of their bondage. And so he shows up to Moses through a fire. Exodus 3, 2, there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. And Moses stared in amazement. Though the bush was engulfed with flames, it did not burn up. And so this is God introducing himself to Moses, showing up in this flame. Now, I would actually love to see this. I, I think I would. There's a part of me that I feel like that would be incredible to, to have a visual picture of God through this fire. And then there's another part of me that's like, not so sure I would be able to, to, to not faint if God showed up and began talking to me through a fire. But he introduces himself to Moses this way, and it's not the only time that Moses sees him as a fire, in fact, on Mount Sinai. Top of Mount Sinai, God shows up again in a fire. And then in Leviticus chapter 9, verse 23, then Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle, so the tabernacle has been built, 
And they come back out and they bless the people again. And the glory of the Lord appeared unto the entire community. Everybody realizes the tangible presence of God. And fire blazed forth from the Lord's presence and consumed the burnt offering and the fat on the altar. And when the people saw this, they shouted with joy and fell face down to the ground. What an incredible experience that must have been to be there and to know that God is there and to see this flame come out of God's presence and just consume the sacrifice that they set up for them there. This is God saying, I am in your midst and I am here with the power and the authority that comes with the fire there's something special something unique about that and this is the experience that i'm hoping that you will begin to pursue and that is to have the holy spirit of god through the power of this fire to be in your life and to envelop your life i want you to have that but this story continues in a very unique twist it's a strange turn but it's important that we see it because where we see here is that Fire can be imitated. Leviticus 10.1 Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, put coals of fire in their incense burners. So this is the same tabernacle, the same presence of God. They put fire in their incense burners and they sprinkled incense over them. And in this way, they disobeyed the Lord by burning before him the wrong kind of fire. Why was it the wrong kind of fire? Because they started it. They're the ones who started the fire, and that's a problem. And see, what happens for you and me is, is when we don't have the fire of God in our life, we seek to start our own fire because we were not meant to live life without that passion, without that drive, without that hope. We're designed to live with the fire of God in our lives, and so when you don't have the fire that is started by God, then you begin to look in other places. And that's exactly what Nadab and Abihu do. They start this strange fire and they disobey the Lord by burning before him the wrong kind of fire, different than what he had commanded. And because it was the wrong fire, a fire blazed forth, verse 2, from the Lord's presence and burned them up and they died there before the Lord. And so what you see here is not only can God come to us in this flame to introduce himself to us and to show us his power and his authority in our lives, but it can also come to us in judgment. We see that in the New Testament, Hebrews 12, 29, for our God is a devouring fire. And I love the, the idea of what fire can do but i also dread the idea of the danger of fire fire in the wrong place a, a home burning down someone being dramatically injured by fire that's the horrific side of fire and so there's two sides of fire and we should not play with this nadab and Abihu who were playing with fire and they end up being destroyed by god's fire and so i want to challenge you today to examine yourself and ask yourself am i being warmed by a fire that was not made by god because if this fire is not made by God, then it will destroy me. But God's fire brings elements to our lives that we should look for and we should hope for. The first one of those elements that it brings to our life is his fire is light for our lives. His fire illuminates our lives and brings revelation. Light brings revelation. When there's light in your life, you can see things that otherwise you wouldn't be able to see. Spiritually speaking, you and I live in a dark world. We live in a very dark world. And I think what happens sometimes in our lives is we try to work by our own understanding, by our own knowledge, by our own information. And because we're dealing with our own knowledge and our own information we miss things that god could reveal to us if we were enveloped by the holy spirit of god that fire that would illuminate everything around us what if there are things in your life that you need to see things that you can't see you're blinded to them blinded by the darkness of arrogance blinded by the darkness of insecurity blinded by the darkness of just not knowing that there's something in your life that isn't right and so you're blinded by this ignorance and god says i want you to see what's happening in your life and he wants to do this a revelation of fire that he brings into it i want to see more about what can be changed about me to be more like god i want to be more like jesus christ and if i don't know what's not like him because i cannot see it then i can't change that to be more like him 
And so light brings revelation to my own life. There are things about me as a person, things about me as a husband, things about me as a dad, things about me as an employer, things about me as a friend that I don't know that need to be changed to be more like God. And through the illumination, the revelation, the Holy Spirit fire in my life, my eyes can be open to that and I can become a better person, a different person, become more like Christ because of what is revealed to me. And God reveals things to us. Numbers chapter 9 verse 15. On the day the tabernacle was set up, the cloud covered it. But from evening until morning, the cloud over the tabernacle looked like a pillar of fire. And it says that this was a regular pattern. Every time it was dark, that that cloud had the appearance of fire. In the darkness of your life, the Holy Spirit can begin to illuminate things. I believe there's probably things in your home that you don't know about, that need, you need a revelation from God that will be illuminated if you allow the fire of the Holy Spirit to burn bright in your life. There's things in your workplace. If you allow the fire of the Holy Spirit to illuminate your workplace, you'll be able to see attitudes that you didn't know were there. There may be people who to your face are kind and wonderful and you think that you're your, they are your friend, but behind the scenes they are deceitful and they are wretched and their real intention is to destroy your life. Not everyone who is there acting like your friend is really your friend, but through the power of the Holy Spirit, you can get revelation to find out who is your friend and who is not greater yet through the power of the Holy Spirit there are people around you who need stuff and you may not know what they need but because of the illumination that comes through the fire of the Holy Spirit you can understand things that otherwise you would not have understood and you can help people who otherwise you would not have been able to help hey I don't want this for myself I want it to flow out of my life into other people's lives so that other people can be blessed Because he's illuminated my life. I want my life to be a light that shines. So that other people can see God. When I walk into the storehouse. When I walk into the business place. I want people to see God. And the only way they're going to see God. Is if my life is aflame with who he is. I don't want them to see me. I have nothing to offer them. I really don't. The only thing I do have to offer them is Jesus Christ. And that's who they really need to see. And so when my light is filled with this fire, it illuminates everything. And not only does it illuminate everything, His fire purifies us. His fire purifies us. Let's be honest with ourselves today. Each of us has things in our lives that we need to be purified from. We have things in our hearts, thoughts in our minds. It may be insecurity. Anxiety, worry, it may be corruption, it may be fear, it may be hate, it may be bitterness, it may, it may be perversion. We all have something that God wants to purify from us. And His fire purifies us, it refines us. I like how Isaiah put it. He says, it was in the year that King Uzziah died. That I saw the Lord, he was sitting on a lofty throne and the train of his robe filled the temple and attending to him were mighty seraphim, each having six wings. With two, they covered their eyes. With two, they covered their feet. With two, they flew. And they were calling out to each other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Here's something that happens to us. When we really get into the presence of God, we begin to realize how holy he is and how unholy how not holy we are we don't have our act together as much as we think we do we feel good when we compare ourselves to other people or we surround ourselves with people that are like us but you get in the presence of an almighty God and the only thing you can do is cry out holy 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 is the Lord of heaven's armies the whole earth is filled with his glory And as they cried out, their voices shook the temple to its foundations and the entire building was filled with smoke because there was a fire. And so here's Isaiah's response. He said, it's all over. I am doomed for I am a sinful man and I have filthy lips and I live among people with filthy lips. Yet I have seen the king, the Lord of heaven's army. And the story, it just gets better. 
Because he says, then one of the seraphim, one of those mighty seraphim, flew to me with a burning coal he had taken from the altar with a pair of tongs, and he touched my lips with it and said, this coal, this fire has touched your lips, and now your guilt has been removed and your sins are forgiven. Here's what the Holy Spirit of God does. When it is a flame within us, it begins to purify us. Here, uh, you, you need to get this. The moment you ask God to forgive you of your sins, in that moment you are forgiven. No doubt about it. But how many of you know that you have walked away from an altar where you ask God to forgive you? And then in the next week or the next month or the next few months, you made the same exact mistake. What you and I need is to be purified. I don't need to just ask God to forgive me for what I did wrong or forgive me for what I said wrong, or forgive me for what I thought wrong. I need to ask God to purify me. Father, I want, you to, I want you to forgive me, but don't just forgive me. I want you to touch my lips with that coal that is a flame and purify me because I don't want to keep walking the way that I'm walking. I don't want to keep doing the things that I'm doing. I need the Holy Spirit fire to be cleansing me, every part of me. The psalmist wrote, he said, you have tested us, O God. And you have purified us like silver. When they purify silver, they, they heat it until it melts. And when it melts, the dross rises to the top and they scoop it off the top. So that nothing is left but the silver. This is what the fire does. Proverbs 17 says the fire tests the purity of the silver and the gold. The gold as in it blemishes until the fire melts it and that blemish can be removed. The Lord tests the hearts and, and this is what God brings to our lives through the fire of His Holy Spirit. He doesn't just illuminate our lives and, and bring revelation to our lives, but He purifies us so that when we were, when we were brought before Him, when we come for, before Him refined as pure gold. And that's the way I want to be before God. Someone who's been cleansed Someone who's been purified. The third thing that fire does, fire comforts us. Fire makes us feel good. I, uh, there's nothing better, nothing better than when you're on a camping trip. I like to go camping. And I love in the mornings when, when the sun's coming up, to get out, to go out there. And that fire that we had last night is, is smoldered down. But you can just stoke it a little bit and throw on a few more logs. And, and this is how I do it. I like to go out there with my my lawn chair, I like to take my Bible out there, and I like to get the fire going, going good, so hot you can't sit close to it. And I like to just sit there and read my Bible. It makes me feel good. It makes me feel comfortable. Air is crisp. It's clean. You're all the way from the city, just out there, just you and God. It's, it's a really incredible thing. If you haven't ever done that, you need to try it. It's, it's something special. But here's the problem. I mentioned this earlier with Nadab and Abihu. If you're warming yourselves, if you're making yourself comfortable next to a fire that wasn't made by God, then you're asking for trouble. The fire that is bringing comfort to your life, if it's not God's fire, if it doesn't have God's blessing on it, then you're asking for trouble. When Jesus was near the end of his life, he went to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. And while he was there praying, they came to arrest him. And after they arrested him, the Bible says that Peter followed from a long distance away. And he followed him to his trial. And when he got to the trial, it says that Peter went right into the high priest's courtyard. And there he gathered around with the guards, the very people who were Jesus' enemies and who had arrested him. Peter is now hanging out with them. And he's warming himself by a fire that they have built. And this is what a lot of Christians do. When the fire of God has grown dim in their life and they begin looking for another answer, they begin building fires that aren't of God. And I don't know what that is in your life. It may be a false idea. It may be an unhealthy relationship. It may be money. It may be power. It may be popularity. You may be pursuing something on the Internet. I don't know what that fire is. But if you're warming yourself by the enemy's fire, you're only asking to bring destruction on yourself. He was warming himself by the enemy's fire. And at some point in the story, Jesus turns and looks at Peter. And the Bible says he catches his eye. 
And Peter leaves that moment. And it's the last time he would see Jesus alive. The last time he saw Jesus alive was while he was warming himself by the enemy's fire. But then Jesus rose again. And when Jesus rose again, he begins to show himself to his disciples. And the Bible says that Peter said, hey, I'm going back to fishing. I've been following Jesus for three years. It didn't work out the way I hoped it would work out. And so I'm going to go back to fishing. And the others said, we're going with you. And so they go out and they're on the lake. And then Jesus crosses the lake by them. And he goes to the shore. And Peter recognizes it's Jesus and just jumps off the boat and swims to shore. And when he gets there, John 21, 9, and when he got there, he found a breakfast waiting for him, fish cooking over a charcoal fire. This was a fire that was made by God. Because there's a difference between a fire that is made by God's enemies and a fire that's made by God. The fire that was made by God's enemies. They come to Jesus or Peter and they say, you're one of his. Peter denies him. A second time, Peter denies him. A third time, three times, he denies him. Don't don't miss this. When you're comforting yourselves with the world's fires, you'll begin walking away from the word of God. If you find yourself questioning the validity of the word of God, you need to question the fire by which you're being warmed. But watch what happens. Jesus, at this moment, looks at Peter and says, Hey, Peter. Do you love me? Peter says, you know, Lord, I love you. He says, all right. I'm going to ask you a second time. Do you love me? And Peter says, you know, Lord, you know I love you. And Jesus said, you denied me three times, and so I'm going to ask you three times. Do you love me? Because Jesus wants us to be comfortable in his presence. Peter could have sat there in condemnation, but Jesus doesn't let him stay in condemnation. He brings him to a place of revelation. And Peter says, I love you. I love you. I love you. And here's Jesus' response. Well, then go feed my sheep. In other words, Peter, I haven't rejected you. You're still one of mine. And I still want you to take care of my people. That is exactly what Jesus wants you to hear when you are coming into his presence. He is not there to reject you. He is not there to push you away. He is there to bring you up next to the fire and say, hey, buddy, I want you to come over here. You've been going through a difficult time, and I want to comfort you. I want to help you. I want to pick you up. Jesus does not hate you. He's not mad at you. On the other side, he wants you to bring you to a place of revelation where you recognize that you love him and that he loves you. And if you will stay by his fire, you will get that revelation. And so there's light. There's purity. There's comfort. And the fourth and final thing is this fire empowers us. Every single one of us who came here, unless you walk, You came here by the power of fire. Tiny little sparks in your engine, continually firing. That's that's the power of fire. Some of you are thinking, but I drove an electric car. There's a plant somewhere. They're burning coal on your behalf. You got here by fire. Fire has power. This is what God wants to do. He wants to put a fire in your life that gets you off of static, that gets you out of a place where you can't move, that gets you to a place where your engine is beginning to move and you can pick up speed and go from where you are. You feel like you're stuck where you are. God doesn't want to leave you stuck right there, but he wants the fire of his spirit to be alive in you, to get you from where you are to where you need to go. You're not getting there by yourself, and you're not going to get there by a fire that you have made or anybody else has made. You're only going to get there if you have the fire that illuminates your path and it purifies your heart and brings comfort to you and brings energy to your soul it empowers us we see this in the word of God Matthew 3 11 John said I baptize you with water those who repent of their sins and they turn to God but somebody is coming soon who is greater than I am so much greater I'm not worthy to even be his slave or carry his sandals but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with 
fire. There is a power that should be on our lives. I don't want to live for Jesus Christ without power. I want power to be in me. I want to be able to do what he asked me to do. So some of you, you, you struggle to live for God. You struggle to get that power. The Word of God actually tells us that, he, that fire comes from His Word. And so if you want to build up that fire that is in your life, get back in the Word of God. Don't just read it on Sunday, but on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday. I want you to go to the Word of God thinking to myself, I'm putting logs back on the fire. I am building up the fire that is in my life. I want that power I don't want to go to work today without power I don't want to have to deal with those people without power I don't want to have to mess with my finances without power I don't want to have to correct what's wrong in my life without power I want the power of the Holy Spirit to make that happen I love the picture that we see in Acts 2 1 it says on the day of Pentecost all believers were meeting together in one place and suddenly there was a sound from heaven as a roaring mighty windstorm it filled all the house where they were sitting so in case you're not familiar with this this is where the this is where the christian church launched this is the story of the launch of the christian church and verse 3 says then what looked like flame what look, looked look like fire appeared on each of them and everyone present was filled with the holy spirit and began speaking in other language as the holy spirit gave them the ability this is this is what god wants to have in your life and so now, in, in case you don't know this, the Bible says the Holy Spirit is a gift. Eight times it refers to the Holy Spirit as a gift. You don't have to beg for it. You don't have to plead. I want you to envision God saying, I want you to have this. This is for you. And you, you have to pray and, and ask God for that gift. But it, it, he's not withholding it from you. And so when you receive the Holy Spirit, I want you to have the picture, the image of God as a flame that is in my life. Not just a little flame, not like a... Not like a pilot light. That's not what it's like. It's, it's the whole body, just from my head to my, my toes, fingertip to fingertip, just engulfed in who he is. And, and this is what, what you, you need to have. But this is what's so true about this. Is where it says that the fire is started by God. It also says it's up to you to maintain the fire. Leviticus 6.12. Meanwhile, the fire on the altar must be kept burning. It must never go out. Each morning, the priest will add fresh wood to the fire and arrange burnt offering on it. He will then burn the fat of the peace offerings on it. Remember, the fire must be kept burning on the altar at all times. It must never go out. And so if you're a Christian here today and you're wondering what happened to that power I used to have, what happened to that light I used to have, what happened to it? The fire has gone dim. I fear that many Christians are living on smoldering embers. There's a little bit of smoke there, but you can't see the flame. And that's where we're living. And so this verse says, it is up to me, it is up to you to keep the fire burning. The fire comes from God, but He expects us to maintain the fire, to build the fire. And the way you and I maintain the fire and to build the fire is through our relationship with Him, getting in His Word, Talking to Him through prayer. Being a part of worship. Coming to the house of God. This is how we build the fire. But when I start missing those things, then the fire begins to go out. When I don't read the Bible, and I don't show up for worship, and I don't participate, the fire begins to grow dim. But it's up to us to bring the fire to its fruition, to be what it is. I want my hope this morning is that you'll come to a place where you will begin to seek to be a person who is completely and entirely enveloped and consumed with the fire of the Holy Spirit in the way that I believe that God would have for us. If you agree with that, will you stand to your feet this morning and let's give the Lord a great big hand clap of praise. In just a moment, I'm going to make, I'm going to pray in just a moment. But before I do, I want to share something with you. The Holy Spirit is a gift, and you can ask for the Holy Spirit and pray and ask for it. But I, I want to invite 
you to come to the front. And you don't have to. You can pray right where you are. But here's why I think it's special to come to the front and pray. There's something unique about stepping forward as a sign, a physical sign of saying, that's me, God, I want that. Something special. And if you want to make that statement, I invite you to come, as many as you want to come. And here's, and I'll tell you what you can pray. Pray that God would consume you with that fire. Pray that God would, would let His fire burn so bright in your life it would illuminate every, every corner. Pray that that fire would be so hot it would purify you from everything in there that doesn't look like Jesus Christ. Pray that that fire would be so warm that it would comfort you wherever you are in your life. And pray that that fire would be so powerful that it would drive you forward. It would drive you off of static. It would drive you off of center and move you forward into where God wants you to be. You pray your words, and I promise you, God hears your word, and he will begin to build that fire in your life. And if you will keep stoking that fire, let me pray with you in the name of Jesus. Father, I am praying that just as you did on the day of Pentecost, your word says that you poured out your spirit and there was a fire that sat upon each of them. I am praying in this house today that your Holy Spirit would come down on us as an incredible fire that would be ignited in each of our lives, burning in our minds, burning in our hearts, engulfing our entire lives, Lord, from everything that I am and every thought, Lord Jesus, that it would illuminate everything that is around me and that it would purify me, God, to the, to the very farthest corners of my life. And that it would comfort me, God, in my time of distress. That it would empower me to move forward with boldness like I've never experienced before, God. I don't want to just be a person who says they're following you and I'm living off of smoldering embers. I want to be a person that is consumed with that Holy Spirit fire in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord. Pour it out on us today. Let it be on us today. Light it up in us today in the name of Jesus Christ. And we need a fresh wind.